for some reason, October, everybody thinks they're supposed to scoot out. I went to see the mountains yesterday, so um, you know people can go on Saturdays rather than Sundays. But I'm just saying, so I'm just playing. I'm in one of those weird, weird places tonight. Y'all still have to love me in spite of that, right? Amen. Oh, thank you, thank you. And this, this ma'am, I agree with you, and don't go too far, Pastor. I know, I know how it works for sure. And this is Natalie. Do I remember her name? Natalie, we're glad to see you tonight. Everybody say hey to Natalie. Hey. Now we've embarrassed her really good. So you can look at your um, bulletin and see all the things going on. This is, of course, the last day for the backpacks. I know that um, Angela and others are going to be working hard to uh, finish those up and get them where they need to be. Um, so we'll get a report on that. But it looked like many more came in, I felt like, today. I'm really pleased with that. I want to also invite you to the annual meeting of our association. You don't have to be an approved messenger to actually come to the meeting. So if you'd like to come, it'll be great and a good crowd. Typically, you know, it's uh, many churches represented and many pastors. And so it's, uh, it's an enjoyable time. I really do like to be there. And a trunk or treat, be ready. I hope you'll be praying for that. We want to do fun stuff, obviously. But we want the Spirit to be at work, and everything we do is intended to, to bring people closer to the Lord and uh, more aware of the church and more interested in the things of the kingdom. So pray that way. Pray that God uses it, and there's a lot of people. Pray that Natalie will be here. I'm your friend, Natalie. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so pray for that, and um, let's pray together now. Father, we love you. We give you praise. We honor you and bless your name. You are very good to us, and uh, we just want to know um, how close we can be and how much we can receive from you and ultimately how much we can give you in honor and praise and glory. Do the work in our lives, Lord, that we need you to do. We uh, trust you. We acknowledge your authority and uh, your um, warmth and caring, your mercy and grace that you have for us. Help us to um, be tuned into that. This world is distracting and always trying to throw us off our game and mess up our commitment and just uh, flood our lives with every bad thing. Help us to be committed instead and focused instead and love you diligently and passionately, Lord. I pray uh, every person here tonight, they would be a special blessing, special anointing, Lord, for the faithfulness and the desire and uh, the level of commitment to be here this night, Lord. We're waiting to, to meet you and hear from you, and we give you uh, praise and our expectation for that to happen. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. If you will, get your hymnals back out. Turn to page 514 when we all get to heaven. And we do have... Hey, don't, actually, you don't have to get your hymnals. Out. You can look at the board if you'd like to. But if you have to have the notes...
toter. Tonight's going to be leaning on the everlasting arms, page 333 for the book toters. Book toters? Book toters. Him to him My look, or, look ratters. Hey, you sound good. Right? Yeah, you did. Sound. I could hear you up here. Tonight we're looking at uh, Hezekiah, and we're shifting permanently into the 
southern kingdom, Judah. You might remember last time that the king in the north, Hosea, uh, the last time was the last king. And so the north is over. They have effectively been obliterated. There's still people there. They, of course, couldn't round up every single citizen down, down every uh, holler and every secret driveway, but they rounded up anybody that was anybody, and they took them to other places, and they brought in anybody's from those other places and settled them in Samaria, the northern kingdom area. Uh, Hezekiah is now the king in the south, and so he would be receiving reports of what happened in the north, and he would uh, hear about it, and um, he did not have any kind of relationship or alliance with the Assyrians. Uh, and in fact, himself, during his reign, he came under great risk, great threat, and the southern kingdom in Jerusalem faced siege and invasion themselves. This is a uh, a period in Scripture that covered 2 Kings 18 through 20 and 2 Chronicles 29 through 32. So there's a lot of material there, uh, a lot of description of the, of the events of Hezekiah's reign. Uh, we're not going to touch on all of them. I want to use the time tonight to talk about one particular subject as it relates to Hezekiah. Um, he is one of the king's most highly praised in Judah, in the southern kingdom. He is one of the, he did good in the eyes of the Lord, uh, and good all the way, and followed in the ways of his father, um, David. On the chart that I've given you, I think it is exceedingly positive. When the scripture says anything positive about a king, then the judgment of that king on the chart is he did right. Uh, and if you go and read some of them where they did a little right and a little wrong, they don't credit that king as a righteous king. They credit him as a failure. Um, so many of the charts I've seen, only about four or five kings are listed as a righteous, a successful, a God-honoring king. On the chart that I've given you, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them listed as he did right and about half of those the description is he did right and followed the ways of his father David but he did not and then there are uh, several items listed in his uh, failure to uphold fully and completely what God had expected of him but Hezekiah is one of the top four he did rights Asa is one of those Josiah is one of those Hezekiah and I believe Jehoshaphat was the, the fourth one that was exceedingly successful um, and had a, a great kind of uh, spiritual resume before the Lord. We're looking then tonight at Hezekiah. He is the king in Jerusalem uh, during the time of the Assyrian domination. Uh, and as part of his reign in Jerusalem, he's going to face a serious invasion. Uh, Isaiah talks about that invasion um, there's the letter to the, um, to the people from the Assyrian king. Why do you trust in your uh, God? All the other gods have failed. All the other people that I've conquered, your God's going to fail as well. We, we're kind of familiar with that. There's the message. Um, and then you might recall one of my favorite passages even in the Old Testament is Hezekiah taking the letter from uh, the Assyrian king and laying it on the altar. Have you ever done something like that before? I have with a, with a certain issue or an object that represents something that is a real challenge, and, and you bring that before the Lord just to say, here's, here's the symbolic representation of whatever this problem or this difficulty or this challenge is. Well, that's uh, Hezekiah. Uh, we don't have time to deal with all of that, but to, let me take you to 2 Kings 18, and then we're going to go over to 2 Chronicles and spend most of our time there. Just the introduction in 2 Kings 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. 
And then kind of the, the backup phrase in verse 4, he removed. That's always the second condition. You did what's right or you did what's evil and then you kept the high places and allowed idolatry or you removed the high places. So he removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. He even broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses has made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it and even had named it Nehushtan. They named it and idolized it, and they were worshiping it. Verse 5 says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. That is a high measure of faithfulness. Now, he held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. I think that's a reference to Uzziah, who is uh, Hezekiah's grandfather, I believe is where he was in the line. No, great-grandfather. And you might recall Uzziah was very sick, successful until a certain point where he decided, I can do whatever I want. He thought he would become the priest. So he was faithful to the Lord until or at that certain point. And here the writer says, Hezekiah held fast to the Lord and did not stop ever, did not turn his back on the Lord. In verse 7, the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Uh, he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and he did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines. As far as Gaza, there's an interesting name, right? Same Gaza, same place, same locality. And in honesty, these are the same people. The same people, the Palestinians today, are derived from, from numerous kinds of, of uh, migrations, in, in and outs, ethnicities, uh, and yet still it's the same location and the same general reference to the same people. So they were enemies of Israel even back to this time and before. Um, and Hezekiah is recorded here in his um, environment and his interaction with the Assyrians from the north and the Philistines uh, from the south. Uh, go to Second Chronicles 29, if you will, now. We'll be there in just a minute. What I want to talk about is revival. Hezekiah is a, a model, a demonstration of a great revival. I think that Hezekiah is the one that uh, by himself added about 100 years to the life of Judah. The Assyrians are on the move. They've defeated everybody. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are on the doorstep of Jerusalem. They're ready to wipe out Judah. God has already pronounced judgment against Judah. And I think Hezekiah single-handedly rose up against the forces of evil and said, we are going to call on the Lord. We're going to be faithful. We're going to dedicate our lives to the things that are right. And because of that, the Lord relented. Judgment had been pronounced. Judgment was right outside the door. And he saw the heart of Hezekiah and the heart then of the people in response to Hezekiah. And God's judgment was withheld. Not, not forever. Uh, in fact, looking at the chart of the kings, you see uh, Hezekiah's son Manasseh, who turned out to be one of the most evil of all of the kings of Judah. And then his grandson Ammon, also evil. Josiah was the last decent king in the lot. He died very young. And then the rest of them uh, were, were nieces, I'm sorry, nephews and sons of Josiah uh, and a brother. And it just all kind of collapses at that point. But there was something about Hezekiah. And nobody could argue with 185,000 Assyrians outside the door over at Fort Gordon. We need God's hand. Only hope we've got is God. Wouldn't you love to see uh, the, the conditions in our own nation where people would realize the only hope that we've got is the Lord? Uh, what I, I'm really terrified by in that statement is things have to get pretty bad for people to say the only hope we've got is the Lord, especially with how much wickedness there is and how much perversity there is and how much idolatry there is in the world, in our nation. People will love anything, it seems, before they would turn their hearts to the Lord and love Him. 
But here it's happened. Hezekiah has called out for a revival. And Hezekiah is a great model for me to say to you, we need revival. We need revival. And you know, of course, I'm not talking about the three-day meeting. You write on the calendar and you try to to look up somebody to get on the schedule that everybody's going to like and you're going to feel safe about letting them in your pulpit. And I'll just let that sink in with you for a, for a minute or two, you know. Or the music group where you're going, man, I'm worried about anybody in that category. Amen. Just see if y'all are listening to me or not over there. So, I mean, you just, you just can't think revival is we put this on the calendar and presto changeo, we, we've got the hand of God. Revival is vastly beyond those kinds of things. Clearly, we need revival. We need the change of heart that uh, revival brings or that revival is precipitated upon and uh, that that is the call and the desire it's one thing for us to sit around and talk about how bad things seem to be in the world it's one thing for us to list all the problems and shake our heads that something's not right something's just not working like it ought to be and remembering the the good old days kind of all of us now are in the category where we we remember better days and uh, we all want to say, I, golly gee, what's wrong with all those young people today, right? Y'all just had this conversation today, I can tell already. So uh, that's one thing. I understand having those conversations. We have those conversations with 420-somethings now. Our, our progeny are all in their 20s, and our grandkids are all, you know, what's their future going to be? How, how is this world going to be in their lives? I know all of us with grandkids think this way. So that, that's appropriate. That's understandable. But having a heart for revival is a completely different awareness and commitment and desire. Being able to see the problems and have concern for the problems and the people we love. Yeah, good. That's great. That is certainly an awareness that lots of people don't seem to to have. But going to the next step and saying, God, whatever you need from me, whatever I have to do, however I can conform myself to your will, whatever surrender is necessary on my part, you got it. I'll do it. I'm yours. Whatever it takes. If it can make something happen to preserve the lives of of my people and preserve this nation and make my church strong and viable and fruitful in this time. So we we call out for revival. J.I. Packer writes about the four elements of revival, true revival, and he says this, revival is God revitalizing his church. Revival, Revival is God turning his anger away from his church. Think about that statement. Revival is God stirring the hearts of his people. I think for the hearts of the people to be stirred, they've got to be pretty pretty flatlined, right? They've got to be pretty um, weak and uh, and, uh, pretty low on the scale. Revival is God displaying the sovereignty of his grace, making it known how much he loves and cares and how strong he is working in the world. So what I want you to get out of the statements from J.I. Packer is the simple understanding that revival is not for the world. Revival is for the church. It's for the people of God. And just imagine what could happen in the world, in our land, if revival could break out among the people of God, among the church. God allows that Uh, impact to bleed over in such a powerful way and I don't even think that's the best way to say it actually it's not like a secondary result it is the whole result of revival if the church gets on fire for Jesus that fire burns everywhere and the world is strongly impacted all over the place but this only happens when God is able to work and we have to be in the right place before God is able to work. So it's a point of drastic change. Revival means I turn my back on whatever is and I give myself to what could be, what God could actually do. You know the Bible is filled with reports of events, bold, dramatic, and historic 
events. Uh, one of those is what's going on now during Hezekiah's reign, and I think it's directed right at Hezekiah's heart, and I think the message really is, here's how I could use any leader who would choose to stand for what's right and who would surrender his heart to me. If we had a leader like that today, that could be the kickoff, that could be the spark that actually could start revival. Could you imagine a president doing an Oval Office address and sitting behind his desk and not giving some wishy-washy, namby-pamby speech about uh, religion or uh, God bless America, but to come and say, um, you know what, everybody in America needs Jesus in their heart. And the Bible says that you ought to repent and ask him to forgive you of your sins. They could use Revelation 3.20 where we were at this morning. Wouldn't you love to hear the President of the United States say, Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would open the door, I would come in with him and sup with him and he with me. And that means you are lost and you need to be saved. Boy, this place would go upside down in an instant. Or maybe right side up, right? What, what kind of impact might that have? That's what happens with Hezekiah. The previous kings were not good kings. Ahaz, his father, was not a good king. You might remember two, I think, weeks ago we talked about Ahaz. Um, and he was as extensively ungodly as he possibly could be. Not only did he allow the high places to remain, he set up idols everywhere he could think of to set them up. Everywhere he went, he saw a high place. He saw the spreading tree where the idol is worshipped. And it says he stopped at every place and said, we need to talk to this God and we need to talk to this God. He pursued every false God he could think of. So here with Hezekiah, the years 715 B.C., seven years after the total destruction of the northern kingdom, the Assyrian army is at the gate. I want you to get the full picture um, j just in case uh, maybe you don't remember some of what we have studied over the, this, this last year or so. There's been one bad king after another, so many of them. Um, the first three, the Bible's uh, summary of each is something like, He did not walk in the ways of his father. David did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The rest of the kings uh, kind of talked about this already. Uh, all the way to Hezekiah, they were lukewarm, iffy. Um, some did okay in following some of the ways. Uh, the result is 134 years of corruption, of failure, of evil, of seeking false gods, of decay, of spiritual rot, of playing games, of rebelling against God, of God's people living anything but godly lives. Now, 134 years is a long time. And the Lord has allowed this to continue. Um, I, my sense of this is judgment uh, could happen any day. My sense of America is judgment could happen any day. I think it could be any day. Uh, and we kind of see how wicked our own nation is and how quickly, just in our own lifetimes, they've thrown off so many of the, the, the representations of um, pursuing godliness and doing right and having moral foundations. Uh, let's look at some of the prophetic writings during this time period just to see what God has said to the people. In Hosea 5, verses 5 through 12, Hosea um, served under Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So they're the four kings in Judah. Um, Uzziah, the great-grandfather, Jotham, the grandfather, Ahaz, the father, and Hezekiah. He says this in chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. Israel's arrogance testifies against them. Remember, Israel is the northern kingdom. The Israelites, even Ephraim, northern kingdom, stumble in their sins. And then he adds, Judah also stumbles with them. When they go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, they will not find him. 
That means I've had it with these people. He has withdrawn himself from them. They are unfaithful to the Lord. They give birth to illegitimate children. They're not raising their kids in the ways of the Lord. Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones to claim someone else's land. They send their son to the Ukraine, and they work to jockey and find as much money as they can. And they give, oh, that's not in that passage. But it's the same idea. Certainly the leaders fail and they are corrupt. And he says, I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood of water. I am like a moth to Ephraim, like rot to the people of Judah. When God is judging, everything declines. Everything falls apart. Everything fades. In the book of Amos Chapter 2, this is around the time of Uzziah. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors follow, I will send fire upon Judah. Does that not sound like every king that we've studied to some degree? And the prophets are acknowledging these are the things that you are doing that God cannot stand, and he is pronouncing judgment. You follow every foreign and false god, fire is coming. The book of Isaiah, 66 chapters of Isaiah under Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 4 kind of sets the tone, and the whole rest of the book follows that tone. Ah, sinful nation. A people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. So every time the Lord comes to these people, He comes with warning. He comes with challenge. He comes with directness. Here's what you have done. This is wrong. It is contrary. It is an abject rejection of the truth of God. And uh, what we're seeing here is not some um, obscure or distant or shocking kind of event. It's laying a pattern of human history. It's laying a pattern out of how people act and how strongly they have to constantly be Um, testing, evaluating, challenging, examining, understanding themselves. In truth, this is the same thing that we are up against today. The same kind of issues. We are the people of God, and it seems more and more we have abandoned Him. It's easy for us to look at the world and talk about how bad the world is. Sometimes it's not so easy to say, wait a minute, the challenge God is directing is not at the world It's at the people of God. The very people who would call out to him or say his name or declare their allegiance to him. You know, I got my baptismal certificate. I'm on the team. My name's on the roll at Fort Creek Baptist Church. And I, I come every Sunday. Every Sunday. And yet God says, here's what you've really done. Here's what's really happening in your life. Here's the true condition of your soul There are churches today that have rejected the Word of God. That's not a a new thing, by the way. It's been going on a long, long time. But it's like whatever the latest fad issue where the world says, no, you can't believe that anymore. There's always a collection of churches. I was going to say a handful, but it seems like more than a handful. A collection of churches that will say, oh, if this is what the world says, this is what we better do. And where is their allegiance? What is their ultimate value system? There are Christians that have abandoned righteous living. They still go to church and they still believe what's in the book. They just don't know what it is anymore. And they're in love with everything the world offers them. They don't hesitate to say, maybe we ought not. Maybe we should not. This family's not going to do that and go there and talk that way and think this way. There's lots of Christians who don't even process what it means to live a godly life. And so when that's happening in the church, certainly what would be the condition of the nation? God's judgment comes against God's people first. Yes, it will also affect all of God's creation ultimately. But first, it is the people of God. So what is the answer? 
We can follow the great pattern Hezekiah set for what revival looks like. I'm in 2 Chronicles 29, and we're going to see in just a, a few verses uh, what happened and then what Hezekiah has done. Uh, 29, 1 through 6, Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. Same as uh, 2 Kings 18, his mother was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right, just as his father David had done. Then we get some more details. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Do you imagine? This is the temple of the Lord, and Ahaz, his son, had built idols everywhere and had bolted the door of the temple shut. So please understand the drastic nature of that. It's not serve whatever God you want. It's serve whatever God the world offers, but this God you may not serve. The God, the God who made us a nation, the God that our forefathers identified with, the God of whom we have all these stories of power and blessing and the call upon Israel, you may not serve him. And they closed the door of the temple and bolted it down and so Hezekiah, right from the beginning, opens the door. I want to know what the influence was. We're not told in Scripture what got Hezekiah to this point. He's 25 years old. I know some 25-year-olds. They don't think this way. But Hezekiah, the first thing he does upon uh, taking the throne, open the temple clean out the temple and so he makes this his mission he brought in the priests and the levites assembled them in the square on the east side and he said listen to me levites consecrate yourselves now consecrate the temple of the lord the god of your ancestors there's the reflection this is our god we are his people we were raised this way it's where we've come from it's who we are remove all the defilement from the sanctuary um, you remember the altar that came from the Syrians um, that Ahaz had constructed, and then he moved stuff around in the temple and placed this um, idolatrous altar uh, in the place of where the sacrifices are made. So he's saying, we're going to clean this place up, get it back in operating shape. Verse 6, our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. That is total rejection. We reject the Lord. We reject the symbol of the Lord's presence, the temple. We reject the worship of the Lord through the sacrificial system. We reject the word of the Lord, which is the laws and the statutes and his teachings. We don't want any of that. We'll go after all the crazy stuff that, that has the sensuality and the idolatry and the, the, the passions and the pleasures like all the rest of the world. But we don't want what God wants to do or who he is or how he would work. In uh, 2 Chronicles 29, go down to verse 35. And you can see um, the, the outcome at this point. There were burnt offerings in abundance together with the fat of the fellowship offerings and the drink offerings that accompanied the burnt offerings. So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what, it got, at what God had brought about for his people because it was done so quickly. This is a Nehemiah kind of victory. You remember, Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem and it had been sat in disrepair and in defeat for so many years and Nehemiah's like what are you people waiting on and just in a couple of months they rebuilt the walls in the face of great opposition this is a great victory and the people recognized the great victory and all of the people rejoiced this is the power also of a leader Hezekiah says here's what we're going to do it was kind of a like like a like it or not this is the right thing and we're going to do it and when it happened, everybody was pleased with it because God was pleased and the Lord is doing tremendous uh, work through this event. Then go down to chapter 30. And now you see this pattern. Hezekiah gives a call to the people. They've reinstituted the worship of God and all of the practices. And now he's going to kind of phase two in his plan to restore 
the nation to what it's supposed to be. But the pattern is very familiar, coming right out, out of Second Chronicles 7, 14. I think it's important that, that we remember, um, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek their, my face and turn from their wicked ways. There is the scriptural pattern for revival. That's what needs to happen. What we need to remember is, this is God pronouncing over the temple at its uh, consecration event under Solomon. The temple's built. Solomon says, see this building. Please be here, God. We need you here. Let this be the manifestation of your presence, the glory of your power. Let this be the demonstration of who you are and how you work. Let this be the symbol to all the people. Let this be the place. And then the fire fell, and God speaks back to Solomon Yes, this will be the place, and here are the things that will happen, and the people need to respond to me this way. And we get down to 714, and he says, When the bad things come upon them because of judgment, and they turn their backs on me, if my people who are called by my name. We need to be reminded, um, this is not Solomon's formula for revival. This is not the, the chronicler, the writer of Second Chronicles formula. This is God saying, there will be times when you turn away from me and all you have to do to get it back is to do these four things. So Hezekiah, I'm going to suggest that he read about it, that he knew it, and that he understood. I would even suggest at 25, uh, maybe his, his old-time Bible hero was Solomon. And he read the stories of Solomon and whoever was raising him and teaching him was planting this in his mind. Remember Solomon who was promised from the Lord anything you would ask. And he asked for wisdom and strength to lead these people. And God said, bingo, there, there's the answer. We can work with that. We can bless that. And now at 25, Hezekiah has his opportunity. And I would imagine behind the scenes somewhere, Hezekiah says, God, if you'll do that for me, I'll be your man. If you'll do that for me, if you'll work in my life, if you'll make me who I'm supposed to be, I will be the man you need me to be. And so we get to Second Chronicles 30, and he's following exactly the pattern. Uh, let's read 1 through 9. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah. Uh, notice exactly the geography that's being expressed here okay uh, judah is the southern kingdom what is all israel those are the tribes that aren't in their places anymore now geography he sent back to where those tribes were supposed to be and yes there were still israelites living there um, probably a good number of them probably some of them that longed for faithfulness to the Lord and that were raised the right way and would would love to be involved and so they send this word this letter out uh, to Israel and Judah they wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh those are two tribes specifically inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord the God of Israel the king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. They had not been able to celebrate it at the regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. The plan seemed right both to the king and to the whole assembly. They decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan. Um, remember that's where Jeroboam set up the uh, the, the false temple sites, and that is the far northern site and the far southern site in Israel. And so it's, it's an exclamation of everywhere in Israel from one uh, extreme to the other, uh, calling the people to come to Jerusalem, celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrating in large numbers according to what was written. At the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king from his officials, which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Notice he doesn't say, People of Israel, on this day, at this time, in this place, we're having a, a to-do. I really like it. His letter is an invitation for them to come, but it's not, you know, come for the barbecue. Or well, they wouldn't be having barbecue, but you get the idea. And child care provided. It is come back to the Lord. 
Return to the Lord, and He will return to you. Do not be like your parents and your fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that He made them an object of horror as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to His sanctuary, which He has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that His fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites, your children, will be shown compassion by their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn His face from you if you return to Him. What a promise that is, right? What an amazing statement. If you will simply reject this world and the ways of this world and the falsehood and the evil of this world and dedicate your love to the Lord and put your life in pursuit of Him, look what God will do. I will be able to bless your family. I will be able to work wonders in the lives of your children. And I'm reading grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I will even be able to bring them back and reconstitute the nation Turn your face back to me. So I want to look at um, exactly what Isaiah, I'm sorry, what Hezekiah is asking here. And uh, just in the few minutes we have, uh, line that up with the four out of Second Chronicles 7, 14. First, he gives them this call. In verse 8, he says, submit to the Lord. What does that sound like? Sounds like the first one in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which is humble yourself. Humble yourself. Submit to the Lord. It's the understanding where you look in your own heart and say something's wrong. This is not what I want. I, I'm, I'm hitting myself in the head with the hammer. Why did I keep doing this? Spiritual metaphor, but you get the idea, right? Why, why do I keep bringing failure into my life? Why do I keep going after whatever the world says? And keep stumbling over it. To humble yourself is to say, i got to find a way to fix this. I need to turn back to the Lord. I need to submit to Him. We always get this mindset. I think it's one of the, the great evils of Satan where we can evaluate ourselves and come out looking pretty good. In fact, we're really skilled at deciding what's wrong with everybody else and why that makes me okay. The problem is everybody else is looking at what's wrong with you and why that makes them okay. It's funny how well we can see other people's sins and failures and problems and shortcomings. You've got to turn that around and be able to say, here's my problem, God. I, I seek your hand and your power and your salvation and your hope, not only for me, but for my family, for my children, for my grandchildren. And so I humble myself. I turn myself over to you. And then verse 6, he tells them to return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. I think that is um, lining up with prayer. If my people will humble themselves and pray. I think um, that the connection in returning to the Lord is restoring the relationship. I'm not sure we understand well enough that prayer is the relational element of our Christian life. Prayer is not my get, get it now list. It's not my, you know, rub the, rub the genie and, or the bottle at least, and then uh, the, you get your three wishes. Prayer is me and Jesus in deep relationship, uh, me growing closer and closer to him. If you're going to have anything to do with him, certainly if you're going to know him, you have to be in conversation with him. Notice I said conversation. That's what prayer is. It's not you um, do, doing all the talking. You listen, you receive, you grow, you understand. If there's an estrangement in a relationship that you have, if there's a need for reconciliation with anybody else, somebody in your family, somebody that's a neighbor, it's amazing how many people live uh, with a neighbor next door across the street and they hate each other. What do you have to do to fix that? The requirement starts with, could we sit down and talk, please? This is prayer. I want to return to the Lord. I need to start talking to Him and connecting with Him. He says in verse 8, Come to the sanctuary. Um, come to the place where God said He will meet with you. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. What's number three? 
Seek my face. Seek my face. Come into my presence. The heart that is prepared for revival is one that will place all of its eggs in one basket. I take everything I've got, everything I want, everything I believe, everything I'm hoping in, and I lay it before the Lord. It's all about my relationship, and I need Him. That basket is our earnest, gut-wrenching quest for God, our desire to be with Him and before Him. Only when we get serious about being where God is and doing what God wants and becoming completely conformed to the image of Christ can we expect Him to bring revival like we really hope for revival. God's only going to work when He knows you are in it all the way, both feet. You dive in head first. You're sold out, absolutely committed. You're determined that this is what you want. What would happen if uh, your birthday came up and they were throwing a party for somebody else? Would, would you go to that party? What if you got there and the cake had that person's name and all the gifts were for that person and they sang happy birthday, I don't know, to Bob and you're sitting there going, I don't even know who Bob is. Why are we doing this and calling it my birthday party? But this is how we treat God, right? I mean, we come to God's house and sit before God's book and expect God's spirit to be here and we're in a thousand different places. To seek the Lord really means I have to absolutely and totally plug in to who He is and what He's about and where He is working. We desperately need the vital presence of the Lord. Come to the sanctuary. Verse 7, He says, Do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord. He mentions several things that used to be or that should never be. And what he's telling them is, turn from your wicked ways. There's number four. Turn from your wicked ways. The prophets recorded the great sinfulness of 134 years. Historians, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, they have laid the pattern out for us of the great wickedness of these people. And the call to revival is to turn away from sinfulness. I want all of God, and part B, turning from sinfulness, is I want none of this anymore. I want none of this world. I want none of the pleasures of this world. I know that they never will produce at all. Would you look at verse 10 in uh, 2 Chronicles 30? The couriers went from town to town. Um, the people scorned and ridiculed them. But some, nevertheless, from Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun, they humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered following the word of the Lord. So we're in pursuit of revival. Things start turning that way. The leader says, yea, verily, this is who we're going to be. And God says, I, I can get involved now. And he starts to turn the hearts of the other people back to himself. Verse 13. A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread in the second month. They removed the altars in Jerusalem, so everything Ahaz built, they are tearing it down. And cleared away the incense altars, and they threw them into, Kid into the Kidron Valley, they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. They took their regular positions as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. I'm sure they had to look it up. They had their little handbooks and their charts. Where were we supposed to stand? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, that's page 137, section B, paragraph uh, 2. Uh, dash five and so they had to figure out what they're doing and they're so excited about this they got what they need they want to be in the exact right place and god is doing the thing here uh, they splashed against the altar the blood handed to them by the levites 
Uh, since many in the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were not ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. Uh, so they, they really had their instruction books. They kind of messed it up a little bit. And God says, man, this is the greatest thing. This is the greatest thing. These are my people. Look at the earnestness and devotion and commitment. God gave them revival because the people wanted revival. They demonstrated their own humility. That can look a lot, in a lot of different ways. We might even mess up some of the precisions and the exact rules and every little requirement. Fortunately, in the New Testament, we're, we're just infused with the grace of God. And he allows us to stumble a little bit and confuse some of the exactitude of his word. And that's okay. He puts his arm around us and says, good try. You know, glad, glad you're here. Isn't this great? The people want revival. God is at work. They demonstrated their humility. They prayed for restoration. They were seeking the things of God. And they did turn away from their sins. What a simple message this is. What a message that you and I have heard a hundred times, at least in our lives. What a message that the people of God have heard thousands upon thousands of times throughout the history of the church. I wonder how many great revivals we've actually seen during that time. I wonder how many times I've experienced personal revival and felt the passion of the Spirit and new zeal and fire to serve Him. And you, you, you as well. Pray and seek and call out to him for revival. God, we ask that you would change us. That you would set us up for what is good and right. And what works for your glory. I pray first that it would start in our hearts and in our minds. And we would see the badness, the wickedness of our sins. And we would hear the voice of the Spirit. Come back, come close, come to me. Call out to me. Let us hear you speak. And let us come to you with all that we have. We ask it in Jesus' name. I want just like this morning for you to keep your heads bowed. And please just have this time where you're talking with the Lord. And call out to him. Tell him you desire a new fresh wind of the Spirit in your life, in this church, in our country, in this world. Tell him, ask him what you have to do to make it happen. Once you have your answer, obey. Would you close us in prayer?